Oh, please take it away. Andrew Carr from Marcus Tumor Misadmission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, he's chair. Uh, I'm Angie Clard. I'm the organizational secretary of Marxist Humanist Initiative, and I'm just going to say a couple words about our organization. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary, which is a big deal considering that we were founded amidst uh, chaos and acrimony, having been pushed out of the organization that some of us toiled in for years and years. Uh, <clears throat> the, first Marxist humanist organization founded by Raya Donevskaya, uh, who I worked with during her lifetime. <clears throat> she died in 1987, and we are trying to continue her work, which was to further develop Marx's philosophy of revolution, the philosophy of liberation, not to just keep it frozen or to buy into any of the horrible um, <clears throat> interpretations of him and things that were done in his name after his death, but to restore the liberatory philosophy he had and to develop it for our times because nothing stands still. So we are activists in many uh, freedom movements. We are writers. We are theorists. We try to be. Um, we have people in several countries. Uh, <clears throat> our first speakers in um, the UK, in case you can't tell when you hear them. And, um, and we're trying to uh, influence, <clears throat> come in, come in, <clears throat> influence uh, the direction of the left. Uh, we don't tell the mass movements what to do. We're not a vanguard party, we're not vanguardist in philosophy. We think that the masses will work out their own liberation, both how to make a revolution and especially important what happens after, how to make a new society, how not to fall back into capitalism or nowadays into authoritarianism. Uh, and uh, we consider that a heavy responsibility. And we do invite you to, uh, first of all, look at our website which is full of information about us, not only the publication with the latest things on the front page, but all the back pages and then the other pages of our website, which have uh, many, many more writings. Uh, and we invite you to look at that. Uh, Mike's going to ask you to sign a mailing list. We do infrequent mailings, but you can always just write to us if you want to um, talk or participate in anything that we're doing. This is our latest publication. It's called Resisting Trumpist Reaction and Left Accommodation. And it's a prospective thesis we wrote for last year and reaffirmed for this year and have elaborated on. Uh, and it's the best kind of uh, summation of where we're at, where Marxist humanism is at. And what we're inviting you to work with if you want to work with us. Okay, that's Thank all. you. So we're going to hear first from Eric Andrian, who's coming to us live from London. Uh, his uh, presentation is entitled Identifying and Fighting Authoritarianism in the UK, the Case of the Brexit Party. Uh, Eric is a London-based science teacher. He's been an activist for more than three decades in anti-war protests and anti-racist campaigns, and in opposition to government budget cuts. Uh, he writes frequently in the online publication with Sober Senses, publication of Marxist Humanist Initiative. Okay, take it away, Eric. You got 15 minutes. Okay, hello and good afternoon. From London. This paper is co authored by, by myself and Chris Gilligan. Following the rise of the Brexit Party in the UK, we felt it important to explore the beginning of an unprecedented authoritarian trend in British politics. This paper will explore three main points. One, the dishonesty involved in the Brexit Party's claim to be the saviors of democracy in Britain. Two, the undemocratic structure of the party. And three, the rise in support in British politics for strongman 
with links into the international power line. The Brexit party has appeared almost overnight as a new and seemingly formidable force in British politics. It claims that it stands in defence of democracy. What I'll do today is argue that, on the contrary, the Brexit party represents a dangerous authoritarian trend in UK politics. The party was launched in February 2019 to contest the main elections to the European Parliament. In the space of three months, the party went from non-existence to being the party that gained the most votes and the most seats in the UK for the European Parliament. They were the top vote-getter in every European parliamentary district in England and Wales, apart from London. They stood in the election on the slogans of we must leave the EU, the European Union, and change in politics for good. They claimed to be standing in defence of democracy and to uphold the biggest democratic mandate in British history, the 2016 referendum vote in favour of the UK leaving the EU. That is, in favour of Brexit. The claim that the Brexit party defends democracy was perhaps put most forcefully by Claire Fox, a former member of the Trotskyist Infants Revolutionary Communist Party. Excuse me, Eric. You're, yes. you're blocking yourself with your paper. So maybe, okay. maybe look down. Oh, sorry. Look down. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Let's see your face. Okay. Uh, the claim that the Brexit party defends democracy was perhaps put most forcefully by Claire Fox, former member of the Trotskyist Influence Revolutionary Communist Party. She later became a media pundit and is now the Brexit Party Party's member of the European Parliament for the northwest of England. At Brexit Party election rallies in the northwest of England, she spoke the memory of our struggles with democracy, and she pointed out that for the three years after 17.4 million people voted to leave the EU, the biggest democratic mandate in British history, that the UK was still in the EU. And she, as well as other Brexit Party members, argued that the fact that the expressed instruction of majority had still not been enacted meant that voters had effectively been disenfranchised. The crisis in UK politics, the Brexit Party election communication declared, is about more than Brexit, it's about what kind of country we are. The Brexit Party presented themselves as saviors of democracy in the UK against our failing members of, of Parliament, who have defied 7.4 million of us. In so doing, they suggested that they were standing to represent the will of the majority and to bring about Brexit, something that the members of Parliament have been unable to do. One problem with this claim is the fact that the Brexit Party is also opposed to the Brexit plan, withdrawal agreement that Prime Minister Theresa May negotiated with the EU. In other words, if the Brexit Party had been in Parliament over the last few years, they too would have, been, would have voted down the Brexit deal that was designated to bring about the exit, sorry, that was designed to bring about the exit of the UK from the EU. In this regard, the Brexit Party is no different from the failing MPs they voted against. Brexit Party election literature talks about putting the principles of trust, honesty and integrity at the heart of our democracy. But the Brexit Party are guilty of the same dishonesty that they accuse members of Parliament of. The party leader, Nigel Farage, has gone on record as an opponent of, of Prime Minister May's withdrawal agreement. He has said that it is a very bad deal. The Brexit Party are not in favour of leaving the EU as such. They are, put, they are voting a specific form of leaving the EU and no deal Brexit. As Richard Tice, the chairman chair of the, of the party, puts on his website, let's restore trust in democracy, let's promote a no deal Brexit, and let's get our members of the European Parliament around the negotiated table. But there was no mention of a no deal Brexit or getting Brexit party members of the European Parliament around the negotiated table in their election document. If the Brexit Party had explicitly campaigned for a new deal, no deal Brexit, it could not also claim to be defending the 2016 referendum result, because no deal was not one of the options from the ballot. The options were simply to remain in the EU 
or believe in. Terms under which the UK, I'm sorry, terms under which the UK would leave it, but not specify at all. The contrast between what the Brexit Party officially claimed in the election season and what the party leader and party chairman now claims makes the Brexit Party no different from other politicians who say one thing in one context and a contrary thing in another context. It should make us sceptical of their claims about wanting to promote trust and honesty and integrity and, uh, and about upholding the will of 17.4 million. In itself, however, it does not mean it does not mean that the Brexit Party represents a dangerous authoritarian trend. But I think they do indeed represent a dangerous authoritarian trend. To see that this is the case, we need to understand that their lack of honesty and integrity in a wider context, which is what I will turn to now. One important fact is that the Brexit Party does not have the normal structure that political parties have. It is actually a business enterprise and it is organised and run in the extremely authoritarian manner in which businesses are run. You won't find this on the Brexit Party website, but the party's constitution states that it is making, that it is a limited liability company. More specifically, it is the type of LLC that is a, prop, that is a profit-making company. It has a total of five shareholders. In other words, the party is owned by and under, under, under the control of these five individuals one of whom is Nigel Farage, the party's leader. The authoritarian nature of the party is most evident in the powers that it has given the party leader. For one thing, the members of the board that manage the Brexit party are appointed by the party leader, not elected by the party members. In addition, the party leader is the only person specified as having the power to make or approve national statements of the party's policies and the manner of their communication. In other words, Farage, in effect, holds the ultimate power of being the party's sole public voice. The party leader is also empowered to make such other appointments as he sees fit. He does not have to seek the advice of or gain the permission of the board in advance. Finally, the post of party leader is potentially a position for life. He is elected for a period of four years, but there is explicitly no limit to how many times he can be elected. The basic debate party does not allow party members to have a voice at the party annual conference. And the annual conference will consider motions on party policy and strategy. However, any motion passed at the conference, quote, shall only have advisory force. End <laughs> In other words, the annual conference is a talking shop, not a decision-making body. In fact, the party membership has even less power than the European Parliament. For example, they have no power to scrutinise the party budget, let alone propose changes to it. Another important part of the context we need in order to understand the dangerous authoritarian trend that the Brexit Party represents is the political history of its strong leader. Nigel Farage is a far-right politician. He was the leader of the United Kingdom Independence Party, UKIP, when it, when it promoted vociferous anti-immigrant rhetoric and galvanised a surprising 3.9 million votes in the 2015 general election. He has been, and still is, the president of the Europe of Freedom and Direct Democracy, EFDD grouping, in the European Parliament. During the 2014-2019 EU parliamentary session, the EFDD was composed of representatives from far-right parties, including three, three former members of the French Front National, parliamentary leader of the German party, the Alternative for Deutschland, and a member of the Lithuanian Order and Justice Party. The largest group in the EFDD is the Italian Five Star Movement. Five Star, like the Brexit Party, started life, political life as a populist anti-establishment party that claimed support from both left and right and stood for a new, more honest politics. It's currently it is currently in power with the Abbasi far-right Liga party and has overseen re repressive anti-immigrant policies. Nigel Farage was also one of the figures dubbed by sections of the media as the bad boys of Brexit, a description many of them embraced. This new grouping included Richard Tice, the current chair of the Brexit party and co-founder of the EU, the group that campaigned for the in the UK referendum, 
Raheem Kassan is the former editor-in-chief of Breitbart's London Bureau and former advisor to, advisor to Nigel Farage as UK party leader. Andy Wigmore, chief communications officer of Leaders <coughs> EU. And Juan Aaron Banks. Banks is a, is a millionaire businessman who was the other co-founder of Elite EU. He has, also found, he has also funded Nigel Farage in numerous, numerous ways, now been investigated and has been at the centre of allegations of dark money funding in the League campaign. Shortly after Donald Trump was elected in the White House, Farage, along with Sam Whitmore Banks and American political strategist Jerry Gunstein, met with Trump in Trump Tower in New York. This was not Farage's first meeting with Trump, however. During the 2016 US presidential campaign, shortly after the League victory in the 2016 EU referendum, Farage appeared alongside Trump, spoke at a Trump rally, rally in, the, in Mississippi, and the contacts, of, contacts continue to this day. When Trump visited the UK earlier this month, he declared that Farage should be included in the negotiations on the UK's exit from the EU, and, and he had a private meeting with Farage. Farage's connections with the international right do not end there. Since 2017, he has been in talks with Steve Bannon, about founding the Brussels-based far-right uh, foundation. He has also been, in, been involved with now deceased Gian Roberto Casaleggia, the mastermind behind the mastermind behind the Irish Parliament's strategy, which is great, credited with helping steer the Irish Parliament towards the populist right, pushing Eurosceptic messages about sovereignty and immigration. Is the Brexit Party far-right? It is hard for some people to recognise that the Brexit Party is far right. It looks very different from Britain's traditional far right. It doesn't invoke the names, ideology, or military trappings of national socialism, and it doesn't talk about ethnic purity and whiteness. But given Farage's enormous power as party leader and his ideas, history, and political links, we can opine that the Brexit Party project is not merely about leaving the European Union. Its opposition to Brexit as a particular political character. It is riding on the coattails of Farage's well-known xenophobia and immigrant bashing at the time of the 26th referendum. It is taking nationalistic us versus them sentiments and negative attitudes to some immigrants that are widespread in the larger population and exploiting them in the interest of Farage's much broader agenda. In this sense, the Brexit Party is indeed part of the far, part of the far right. Now to conclude, okay. To conclude, in the UK, the collapse of UKIP allowed most of its members and supporters, supporters to rally around Farage and his Brexit Party. The Brexit Party is, without doubt, a populist far-right formation, which has pushed its way into the centre of the UK's Brexit mire. Farage has skillfully exploited divisions within the existing two main political parties over Brexit by his simple messages and appeals to voters. His, his key messages are first. Key, his key messages are firstly that the Brexit issue is not a traditional mainstream left-right squabble. Instead, democracy itself is at stake. And secondly, only he can address the current government and American pluralism. People are rightly worried about Boris Johnson's bid for leadership of the governing Conservative Party. However, it is Farage, as he helps to mainstream far-right ideas who represents a new danger and harbinger of reaction. Okay, and thank you for listening. And thank you. <laughs> okay, that was Eric Andrian from London, a uh, writer for Marxist Humanist <clears throat> publication, with sort of senses, kept right to time, which is excellent. Uh, the next speaker, far left, my far left, uh, is Andrew Clard. Uh, who you've already heard from. Uh, she has been an activist in U.S. social movements and a writer on the movements and on Marxist humanist theory uh, for many decades now. And uh, she, ser she currently serves as organizational secretary of Marxist humanist initiative. The title of her remarks, both times as tragedy, the resurgence of Stalinism among today's left youth. You've got 15 minutes, Ed.
Okay, both times is tragedy, the resurgence of Stalinism among today's, quote, left youth. I'm an old new leftist who began my political life in the 1960s. There were plenty of Stalinists and Maoists around, but there were also huge grassroots movements in the U.S. and around the world. Significant parts of liberation movements, such as those for African Americans and women, rejected the Stalinism of the Soviet Union and China and looked for revolutionary change coming from the masses themselves. Raya Donayevskaya, upon whose philosophy Marxist Humanist Initiative was built, spent her life, which spanned much of the 20th century, battling Stalinist theory and practice and exploring new revolutionary forces and ideas to work out in theory how revolutions might go forward to socialism instead of backwards into state capitalism and, author and authoritarianism as the Soviet Union had done. The failure of the Soviet Union and others to avoid their revolutions transformation into their opposites, we say, and so their failure to go, into, go on to socialism. In my opinion, that is the tragedy of the last century, perhaps the greatest tragedy in all of history, because there was the possibility of creating socialism, but now we may have lost that possibility forever. If what passes for leftism among today's youth is warned over Stalinism, and to a shocking degree, that is the situation we confront today. And what hope is there for the century? The title of my talk, Both Times is Tragedy, harkens back, in case you can get it, to Marx's opening statement in the 18th Brumaire, in which he remarks on Hegel having said that all great facts and people appear twice in history. And Marx said that Hegel forgot to add that their first appearance is a tragedy, the second appearance is as farce. And I, my point is saying that this second appearance of Stalinism today, its resurgence among today's youth, is also a tragedy. The lessons of the 20th century should not be lost. We should be building on them, theoretically. Today we have a f available, fully worked out theories of state capitalism and of Marxist humanism to guide us to avoid those mistakes of the last century. But instead, it seems this post-truth era has brought back Stalinism and other authoritarianisms in force. I never imagined that it would characterize the left for young people today, nor had I ever surfed the internet looking for revolutionary ideas, which apparently is a problem because that's where Stalinism predominates. So I was shocked when I recently attended a conference at George Mason University that SDS uh, students put on. There's a video of this, um, of the presentations on our website, in our journal. You can see for yourself I'm not making this up. The organizers and much of the audience were college-age people who were active supporters of Stalinism. I mean, literally. <laughs> Some actually defended the heyday of Stalin's terroristic rule. They alleged that his crimes against humanity, like killing millions of people, were simply lies. People didn't starve. They weren't shot. Those oh, were God. all CIA stories. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> I asked a young friend, who I'll call Larry, how so many youth could have fallen into this retrogressive <laughs> situation. Larry himself recently left that milieu and now considers himself a Marxist humanist. He told me that after he first heard about socialism five years ago when he was 15, he, quote, of course, went to the internet. Mm -hmm. Quote, I learned, non uh, I learned nonsense, such as that Cohen wasn't actually invaded by the Soviet Union, that Bukharin and Trotsky were secretly Nazi agents, and there was a vast conspiracy of Western historians to cover up the truth. Perhaps this is, I'm continuing to quote uh, Larry, he's, this is a draft of a story he's writing for our web journal, so Perhaps the most crucial element of Stalin's success is its <coughs> utter dominance over YouTube and other social media platforms. The Stalinist YouTuber 
the Finnish Bolshevik, has likely, has likely published more videos alone than the communist left and all its variations have published collectively. And he's far from the only Stalinist out there. But as Larry recognizes, media dominance isn't the complete explanation here. He writes, quote, of course there are some deeper issues at play here. If Stalinists dominate YouTube and Reddit, why do they do so? Yeah. He suggests that the major reason young people go to Stalinism is the simplicity of its response to Margaret Thatcher's slogan, there is no alternative, Tina. That slogan, he writes, quote, is built upon two premises. One is that socialism existed in the Soviet Union. The other is that it failed. To break with the conclusion that there is no alternative, we need to reject one of these two premises. Rejecting that socialism exists in the Soviet Union requires difficult thought about what socialism actually means, while rejecting that it failed just requires memorizing a few fake statistics. And that option is far easier than working out what really happened. My educated guess, <coughs> my educated guess is that a couple of other main factors also help explain why Stalinism is attractive to so many young people, they call them tankies. What? One has to do with their class tankies. background. These tankies seem to be predominantly kids from upper middle class families who are aggrieved at being downwardly mobile in the wake <laughs> of the Great Recession, aggrieved uh, by their own uh, future in the working class. The other related factor is that they may envision themselves as the rulers in a different society. This hypothesis is supported by an internet article on the new Stalinism, which is published by, and you can look it up, Solar Punk Anarchist, that's one word. Solar Punk Anarchist uh, last year uh, wrote a long article, he's had a lot of personal experience with young tankies, because he got flooded with physical threats and disruptions of his site when he started to criticize the internet left. The triolic quote is done. And he says, I've witnessed the online multiplication of young people, mostly young white men, drawn to Stalinism, Maoism, and Kimism, with the growth in the amount of memes, um, <coughs> praising memes, praising Joseph Stalin, calling their enemies kulaks, and threatening to throw oh. anyone who contradicts them in a gulag. I can't help but think a not insignificant chunk of those who like and share, share such memes do so out of a sincere belief in them. Super, uh, su a solar punk anarchist then addresses um, the issue of how people can find this appealing. He writes, quote, there may seem to be little that's appealing about authoritarianism, but that's only if you look at it from the perspective of those over whom the authority is wielded. If you can imagine yourself as the one wielding the authority, in particular the authority to use violence, then authoritarianism can feel liberating and empowering. So authoritarianism allows those who think they'll wind up at the reins of state power, <coughs> uh, 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 the uh, means to coerce, incarcerate, and kill everyone who currently pisses them off. <laughs> Identifying with regimes and ideologies responsible for murdering millions of people makes them feel like badasses. <clears throat> In his book, How Fascism Works, or Jason Stanley, <laughs> argues that fascist politics conjures up a, quote, mythic past and portrays itself as the agency that will return us to that past. Is the Soviet Union such a mythic past to the young tankies? Maybe it is. It seems to me if the left youth just wanted to be anti-American, that would not cause them to harken back to the Soviet Union. They could take up the US's current bo boogeymen, such as Islam or Iran. So there's something special for them about the Soviet Union. <clears throat> we can't afford to wave away the resurgence of Stalinism as just the fumbling and play acting of naive youth. Some of them seem willfully naive, and all of them are being advised and egged on by older and more experienced small s Stalinist and apologist organizations and individuals. But I don't want to put all the onus on youth. 
or to make it seem that the resurgence of Stalinism is only a youth phenomenon. <clears throat> the tanky youth are being advised and egged on by older and more experienced Stalinist and apologist organizations and individuals. You've got five minutes left. Take Rick Wolf, <clears throat> who is supposedly a Marxist intellectual. At the George Mason University conference I mentioned earlier, Rick Wolf shared the stage with Andrew Kleiman over there, Boots Riley, the filmmaker, musician, Maoist, and a rabid Stalinist youth. <clears throat> Not once did Wolf disagree with Stalinist remarks from the other speakers or the audience about how great the Soviet Union had been. He even referred to Stalinist regimes as, quote, socialist countries. This despite the fact that not long ago, Rick Wolf co-authored a book, Class Theory and History, with Stephen Resnick, which argued that the Soviet Union was state capitalist, quote, a particular kind of capitalist class structure, comprised the actual class content of Soviet, quote, socialism, close quote, his book. When Kleiman asked him to explain this glaring contradiction, uh, contradiction between what he said and what he was doing in this panel of agreeing with the Stalinists, Wolf got mad and called Kleiman combative and muttered under his breath that Kleiman is a combative nutcase. This is, you, uh, you can see it in the video. Now, Wolf do, doesn't have the power to squash dissent, dissent the way the Soviet Union did, including locking dissidents up in mental institutions, their favorite ways. But he repeatedly asked Kleiman, why are you doing this? Kleiman answered that, quote, we have to reclaim the vision of liberatory socialism. That can only be done by merciless, ruthless criticism and condemnation of those systems that usurp the name and impose totalitarian control and unfreedom. As long as those two things are confused, the cause of socialism is going to suffer, cause code, quote. Wolf's response was that, quote, desire to have a debate over who's genuinely in the club and who's genuinely out of it, I think that's done more damage than anything else, close quote. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, this response is shocking. Wolf was saying that debating about socialism, it, what it is and isn't, has done more damage to the cause of socialism than things like Paul Pot's killing fields and gulags and so on. But there is a certain logic here. Wolf then conceded, conceded that, quote, people mean different things by socialism. And we can discuss what those uh, differences are and whether they matter or not. Uh -huh. but, he, but he obviously wanted to evade discussion of the differences. He wouldn't criticize the others, and he wouldn't discuss <coughs> anything. You've got two minutes left. Let me also take note of his questioning of whether um, <clears throat> the differences matter or not, he questioned. <clears throat> this is once again an indication of his aims. If the cause you're fighting for is your own political power, then what matters is people's willingness to unite behind you, not differences between Stalinism and liberatory socialism. Communism. For the sake of the youth who are coming to the left but finding Stalinism and seeing it to be taken for kind of socialism, and for the sake of humanity generally, we have to take the fight to Wolf and others like him. We can't allow them to conceal their true aims. For example, we can't allow them to present themselves as ad advocates for a system of worker-owned and managed cooperatives, which he does, when, you can't, when they can't bring themselves to utter even one word condemning a so-called socialist society that had a vast system of slave labor camps and workers' production relations that were just like ours. We have to put an end to these people's evasions and studied silences, and to see to it that um, they say unequivocally on which side of the class divide they stand. The most important fight we have to win is the fight for the meaning of, quote, the left, and socialism and communism and Marxism. Among the public at large, will these terms be understood as meaning what we mean by them, or meaning that the Stalinists, what the Stalinists and their apologists mean? The latter possibility threatens to set back social change for decades, 
as it already has or even permanently, because the vast majority of people around the world will continue to reject slave labor camps, persecution of dissidents, and the same old capitalist relations at work and home, uh, despite state property. That's my end. Thank you, Thank you Anne, and kept to the time as well. We're doing well with that. Uh, our third speaker is Bill Weinberg, who needs no further introduction, but listen up. <laughs> Bill Weinberg of CounterVortex, countervortex.org, is an award-winning 25-year veteran journalist in the fields of human rights, indigenous peoples, ecology, and war. He is the author of Homage to Chiapas, The New Indigenous Struggles in Mexico, published in the year 2000 by Verso Books, and the book War on the Land, Ecology and Politics in Central America, published in 1991 by Zed Books. He publishes daily and weekly news reports from around the world in Canada. Okay, 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, two things to say before I get going. Uh, one is that, um, uh, like everything that I write, this is going to be extremely fact laden, and I just wanted to make clear to begin with that um, every allegation that I make here is um, documented, and uh, it's all online on my website, countervortex.org. Anybody has any questions about any claim I make here, send me an email, I'll send you the documentation. Secondly, um, I've also quite typically overwritten, and I'm going to read very fast to keep it to 15 minutes, so uh, pay very close attention. <laughs> well, today my talk is on the intentionally provocative, but nonetheless entirely accurate thesis that the consensus position of the contemporary left is now pro-fascist. This is not something I am saying lightly. I am not one of these people who uses the word fascism as a baseball bat to beat up on my enemies. I am using it with an exacting respect for its actual definition. This left, or more accurately, pseudo-left embrace of fascism is most obviously where Syria is concerned. Uh, the regime of Bashar Assad is a fascist regime, a leader worshiping one-man autocracy of the far right in its ideological roots, explicitly inspired by Nazi Germany, if you go back to the origins of Assad's Ba'ath Party. When Tulsi Gabbard, now the supposed, supposedly anti-war presidential candidate, notoriously met with Assad in 2017, it was as part of a delegation filled with regime sycophants including adherents of the Syrian Socialist Nationalist Party, SSNP, which as its name implies is a neo-fascist formation. <laughs> the SSNP was briefly in power in Syria in the 1950s and brought ex-Nazis to help run the security apparatus in the manner of Bolivia under the right-wing generals. Today the SSNP is a satellite party of the size equally fascistic Ba'ath Party which continued to avail itself of Nazi talent after coming to power in a coup d'etat way back in 1970. And this regime has, over the course of the war in Syria these past eight years, escalated to genocide against perceived sectarian enemies and disloyal elements of the populace. Apart from massively bombing civilian populations, reducing cities to rubble, and serially using chemical weapons, the regime has, for the past four years, been systematically killing thousands of detainees, amounting to a campaign of extermination, according to a 2016 study by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. The report found that crimes against humanity committed by the, committed by the Assad regime far outnumber those of ISIS and other jihadist groups. And the consensus position of the American left is now one in support of this regime. First, let us dispense with the requisite knee-jerk disavowal that we inevitably hear. Oh, we don't support the regime, we just support U.S. intervention in Syria. Because that is quite simply a lie. When you parrot regime propaganda, when you depict the Syrian opposition as monolithically jihadist, when you cast doubt on Bashar Assad being behind the serial chemical attacks, when you portray genuinely heroic, unarmed, volunteer civil defense groups like the White Helmets as an arm of Al-Qaeda, you are loaning support to the regime and implicitly justifying its massive attacks on civilian populations. This is objectively support of the Assad regime. And if you do not recognize that the pro-Assad position, which means a pro-genocide and pro-fascist position, 
has become the consensus position of the left in the United States and the West, it is because you don't want to. The evidence is obvious and overwhelming if one chooses to look at it. For over a year now, the group I work with, Syria Solidarity NYC, has been holding a weekly Syria peace vigil in Union Square every Friday evening, standing most recently against the bombardment of Idlib province and in solidarity with the civil resistance forces that are besieged there. The civil resistance forces around groups such as Radio Fresh and the local coordination committees, the secular, pro-democratic, unarmed opposition that first mobilized against the regime in 2011 and has managed to survive in spite of everything. One evening back in April, we had the most depressing, if not the most physically dangerous, exchange yet in the many months we've been doing the peace. <coughs> Almost every week as we stand with the Free Syrian flag and signs against the bombardment of civilian populations, we get pushback from leftists. On one occasion, it actually came to violence when a guy wearing a button with the North Korean flag got in my face and took a swing at me, knocking off my cap. But what happened this particular day was more revealing. Some, forgive me, indoctrinated fool who thinks of himself as a progressive and an anti-war type came along and said, why are you doing this? The Free Syrian Army uses poison gas on children. Now, there are so many things wrong with this that I hardly even know where to begin. For starters, our son didn't say anything about the FSA. We support, first and foremost, the civil resistance in Syria. And secondly, the notion that the rebels themselves use poison as gas in rebel-held territory is utterly baseless. It is sheer empty propaganda with nothing to back it up. Any bona fide human rights group will tell you that all the evidence supports the obvious reality that it is the Assad regime that has serially now used poison as gas against rebel-held territories, which is the logic of the dynamic of counterinsurgency and insurgency. Rebel forces almost never commit those kinds of atrocities against the civil populace whose hearts and minds they're trying to win in order to be fish swimming in the sea of the people in the dictum of Mao Zedong. <laughs> it is counterinsurgent forces, such as most obviously the US, using chemical warfare like ancient orange and napalm in Vietnam, which resort to those kinds of ghastly extremist tactics against civilian populations. So when I questioned this individual where he had picked up this bit of egregious disinformation, he said, I read it in the newspaper. And when I asked which newspaper, he said, Democracy Now, which is not a newspaper, but that's beside the point. The point is that Amy Goodman and Democracy Now have repeatedly put figures like Noam Chomsky on the air to abet this ubiquitous false flag theory. Every time the US carries out or threatens to carry out airstrikes against Assad regime targets, in response to a chemical attack, as it now actually happened twice, Chomsky or some such leftist talking head appears on Democracy Now! to irresponsibly conjecture that the attack was actually a provocation by the rebels. And they'll be very careful to say, and I paraphrase, well, we don't like Assad, he's not a nice guy, and yeah, he could have done the attack, but who knows, maybe it was the rebels. Completely irresponsible speculation that then allows listeners like our Heckler to take away from the conversation what they want to take away from it and go away with the impression that the chemical attack was a provocation by the rebels against their own people. And for an example of exactly what I'm talking about, see Amy Goodman's interview with Chomsky on the episode of Democracy Now! that aired April 26, 2017, in the aftermath of the Assad regime's deadly chemical attack at Khan Shikun. You can read it for yourself and see that Chomsky engages in precisely the cynical, disingenuous, and sinister propaganda that I just described. The outrage over two sets of U.S. airstrikes on Assad regime targets in response to chemical attacks is vividly contrasted with the utter silence from the anti-war left over the virtual destruction of the cities of Raqqa and Mosul by U.S. air power in the campaign against ISIS over the past two years, taking a horrific toll in hundreds and perhaps thousands of civilian casualties to not a peep of protest from the so-called anti-war left. But a few regime warplanes get taken out, the same which were recently used in chemical attacks, and few or no actual lives claimed, much less civilian lives, then the anti-war hypocrites recover their sense of outrage and take to the streets and decry the airstrikes on democracy now. Clearly, what matters are regime warplanes, not Syrian lives. These people are not anti-war, they are pro-war, and there is nothing more repugnant than pro-war propaganda disguised as anti-war propaganda. <laughs> but it gets worse. Seymour Hirsch has now become an open supporter of this genocidal regime, a repeated guest on Democracy Now! In a December 9, 2013 interview with Amy Goodman after that year's Gouda chemical attack, he said, quote, 
Inside the intelligence community for the last year, it has been known that the only game in town, whether you like it or don't like it, was Bashar, because the opposition were being overrun by jihadists. The only solution for stability was Bashar. You just have to like it or don't like it, end quote. The Nation magazine engaged in active support for the destruction of Aleppo by Assad's and Putin's war planes in 2016. Stephen Cohen, one of the magazine's stars and contributing editor, was featured in an online audio interview on August 17th of that year, once again dutifully parroting the Moscow line on Syria and Ukraine. But the Syria discussion reached an unprecedented nadir, even for him, echoing the standard Russian propaganda trick of conflating all rebel forces with ISIS, even as the Syrian rebels were actually fighting ISIS. Read the introductory text for the interview, quote, Putin needs a decision by Obama now if the crucial battle for Aleppo intensifies. Putin <coughs> seems resolved to end the Islamic State's occupation of Syria, Aleppo being a strategic site, with or without US cooperation, which he would prefer to have, end quote. Now, what did the Putin-Assad bombing of Aleppo have to do with the fight against ISIS? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. ISIS was not in Aleppo. Its attempts to establish a stronghold in Aleppo were, in fact, repulsed by the very rebel forces that Moscow and Damascus were then savagely bombing. So these figures, which are by any definition the leading lights of the contemporary left, have much to answer for in creating a consensus position in favor of a genocidal dictatorship. And these are just the ones who have enough sophistication to be dishonest and ritually disavow Assad while spreading his propaganda. In contrast are the blatantly pro-Assad factions, those who are not merely objectively, but subjectively on the side of the dictatorship. I'm talking principally here about the Answer Coalition, the poorly named Party for Socialism and Liberation, more aptly dubbed the Party for Fascism and Dictatorship, the International Action Center, People's Power Assemblies, and others. These are all entities which emerged one way or another as offshoots or front groups from the Workers' World Party, whose origins go back to elements of the Trotskyist movement who supported the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956, and subsequently started moving back in a pro-Stalin direction. Today, these groups actually march with portraits of the genocidal dictator Bashar Assad at their hypocritical anti-war rallies. Now, 25 years ago, when the wars in Bosnia and Kosovo were underway, Workers' World, and its most significant front group of the day, International Action Center, were similarly supporting Slobodan Milosevic. And then it really was a somewhat fringe position. Not a lot of the left followed them into that error, more than should have, certainly, but it never became the consensus position. Today, in contrast, the support, the position in support of the even bloodier Bashar Assad is hegemonic. Further examples, the 2016 U.S. Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein, who's gracefully a featured speaker here at the left forum, toes the reactionary consensus line on Syria, and her running mate, Ajamu Baraka, is an open Assad supporter. After the dictator thoroughly controlled pseudo-elections that confirmed his rule in 2013, Baraka hailed this as a repudiation of the West going about Assad's support from the Syrian people and how the opposition was fomented by the gangster states of NATO. Stein herself, in an interview later scrubbed from the internet but retrieved by my expert technician, referred to the Guda chemical attack with no evidence as a false flag, quote unquote. The holiday fundraising statement issued at the end of last year by Veterans for Peace, another now ironic name, hailed the genocidal Assad regime as the, quote, secular, multi-religious Syrian state, and again, portrayed the opposition as all Al-Qaeda and US-created astroturf. The current golden boy of Verso Books, who, by the way, published my last book, <laughs> is Max Blumenthal, another frequent contributor to Russia Today, uh, Kremlin State Media, whose new title, The Management of Savagery, seems to be an exercise in defaming the Syrian opposition in the same terms. He recently said on RT, ever since I, quote, ever since I came out in 2016 forcefully against regime change in Syria, I have been targeted by a small collection of neoconservative and centrist operatives, end quote. Meaning the people, uh, you. Meaning the people who have um, protested at his book promotion events, as I have, now, needless to say, I am not a neocon and I am not a centrist, so that's a calumny right there. But if you were against regime change in Syria, you support the regime in Syria. It is one of the tragedies 
of the whole experience of the Iraq War and the grave damage to political discourse that was done by the damn neoconservatives, that the term regime change has now become synonymous with foreign imperialist meddling in the Middle East. Because Bush and the neocons took up the term and applied it to their Iraq adventure, which was an arbitrary and unprovoked imperialist invasion, there is an unwarranted stigma that attaches to the term regime change. If you look at the term's meaning nearly objectively, regime change is not only something that we should all support under every dictatorial regime on the planet, of which there are many, regardless of which imperial camp it is in, but it is also something that the people of Syria and the rest of the Arab world have been fighting and dying for ever since 2011 under the slogan, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Ash Shab Yurid Iskat An Nizam, the people demand the downfall of the regime. That was the slogan that was taken up by the Arab masses in 2011, and it's still the slogan that animates the struggles that are continuing today in Syria, in Sudan, in Algeria, and elsewhere around the Arab world. The people demand the downfall of the regime, meaning the regimes that were allies and clients of US imperialism, such as those in Egypt and Tunisia and Yemen and Jordan and Bahrain, and also the regimes that made a pretense, I would say, of opposing US imperialism, such as that of Omar Gaddafi in Libya and Bashar Assad in Syria. All of these regimes were equally dictatorships in the Arab Revolution, which swept like a wave from country to country in 2011, and is really still going on today, opposed dictatorship because it was dictatorship. Not because it was a dictatorship backed up by one world power or another. And making it all about the United States is, perversely, a form of nationalism. Time's up. Uh, uh, I'm going to skip to my very last paragraph here. So what do we do about all this? Well, for starters, there are um, uh, there's a generally younger and newer formations on the left that are not co-opted by fascism, and we should be vigorously supporting them. Rise and Resist is going to be protesting at uh, is going to protest at the ICE Gulag tomorrow at 5:30 p.m. at Grand Central Station, and I'm going to try to be there. Serious Solidarity NYC is pushing the issue on our ongoing Union Square vigils every Friday, and we coordinate with a national network called the Committee in Solidarity with the People of Syria, or CISPAS. In Palestine solidarity efforts, I support Jewish Voice for Peace in Adala, New York. I do not support Al Aldo, which is in the Workers' World Orbit. And there are groups such as uh, War Resisters League and Democratic Socialists of America that are basically going along with the pro-fascist consensus, but can perhaps be saved from being fully co-opted by fascism if a conscious struggle is waged in these organizations. But it has to be a conscious struggle. And pushing the issue aside in the supposed interest of unity is part of the problem. Okay, so thank you. That was Bill Weinberg. Next speaker is Jason Stanley, and he will announce his new title, but let me introduce him more fully. He's the Jacob Jurowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. He's the author of How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them, uh, and the previous book, How Propaganda Works, uh, from 2015, Princeton University Press. His other books include uh, Knowledge and Practical Interest, published by Oxford, which was the winner of the 2007 American Philosophical Association uh, Book Prize. 15 minutes, you can announce your title. Thank you. Fascism and Immigration. I'm, uh, so I'm going to stand up if that's OK. Uh, so, uh, so I changed my work, uh, my talk plan, because uh, we now have this sort of nitty gritty discussion in the national arena about, uh, about the detention camps that AOC described as concentration camps. And so I view my work, what I view my work as doing is doing a sort of specific analysis of what so prototypical fascist regimes were like and comparing and contrasting what we have and not making normative claims about what we should do. But my job is to do the work and hit the libraries and, and uh, be very specific. Um, and it's tough in the case of the United States. Um, it's tough in the United States, case of the United States because as I substantiate and I go into in detail in my book and many other scholars like Bradley Hart and Hitler's American Friends, my colleague Jim Whitman in uh, Hitler's American Model have, have substantiated, uh, the United States was to a large extent Hitler's model. So, uh, so in my comp is about, uh, of course, the, the, uh, creating a national state and, the, and in uh, chapter three of part two, Hitler says the country that's come closest to doing this is the United States. Um, so, uh, 
So, uh, you know, as my colleague Tim Snyder has substantiated in Black Earth, well, anyone who's read Hitler's second book, um, you know, Hitler goes on and on about the genocide of the indigenous people in the United States. Um, so we have, uh, we have a lot of features, long-standing features of our politics that are explicitly national socialists. And of course, we also have equally a, a, a fight against that. So we have, we have a long-standing fight against fascism. Uh, uh, if you think about various liberation movements uh, in the United States. Um, so uh, so my, my task is going to be very similar to Eric Andrian's excellent paper, uh, where what Eric was trying to do was say, look, you know, there's a lot of covering, but if you look under the, the hood, there's a lot of, uh, the, you know, what you have is a far-right party. Um, now, uh, so, so I want to focus, uh, I want to call attention to, so, to the role of immigration in classic fascist, uh, fascist politics. Um, so we have this long-standing immig anti-immigration uh, history. In fact, the 1924 Immigration Act is what Hitler is praising in Mein Kampf. Um, so, uh, so, so this, and, and it gets, I, and what I worry about is when you have this aspect of America, which is always there in one form or another, being treated uh, rhetorically as a good thing versus being done but hit under the carpet. I'm happier when it's hit under the carpet. <laughs> so, uh, so earlier this week, Trump tweeted that ICE uh, would deport millions of illegal aliens. Um, he's not the first president to focus on undocumented immigrants for removal uh, in the in the uh, community immigrant rights community. President Obama was, of course, known as the deporter in chief. Um, but uh, but what we th this pa these past few weeks, Trump. Uh, directed ICE to focus for the first time on families. Um, so that was very new. Um, to, the target, to target explicitly in the rhetoric undocumented families and to prioritize them. Um, so I want to look, I want to think about, um, so, so we've, been, we've been dealing with fascist rhetoric and ideology for quite some time. Uh, what I want to think about now is the, is the level to which our institutions uh, are shifting mm -hmm. to, uh, along this dimension. And what, AOC's, what AOC did is, uh, is usefully focus us on that question. Um, so, so if you think about fascist rhetoric and, and ideology, here's a nice quote from Andre, uh, Anders Breivik um, that sort of um, summarizes uh, summarizes fascist ideology uh, quite well. Uh, feminism, corrupt, treacherous politicians, a corrupt, treacherous media, pro-immigration jewelry, and a corrupt academia is a hole in the dike, while Muslims are the water flooding it. Mm. Now that is fascism. Um, so, and what you see there, uh, what you see in that, you know, the corrupt academia, the conspiracy for lax immigration laws, so we've been hearing that. Everything except the mention of Jews, we've been hearing that. But of course, anti-Semites hear Jew when Trump talks about lax immigration laws, mm -hmm. right? That's a dog whistle. Mm -hmm. um, Israel, the politics of Israel, the ethno-nationalist government in Israel complicates matters uh, because to some extent they are promoting fascists. <laughs> so, um, so, so, uh, so, so, but it's the centering of immigration that makes fascism distinct from, say, Stalinism, an equally murderous uh, 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 a form of authoritarianism. So as Oscar Mosley, the head of the British Union, uh, uh, said, uh, you know, he ran on a platform of entirely ending immigration. This is what Eric Andrian, the link between Mosley and the kind of features that uh, Eric Andrian was talking about. Britain for the British was their motto. Um, so here's a quote from Mein Kampf. Uh, I know that this is unwelcome to hear, but anything crazier and less thought out than our present laws of state citizenship is hardly possible to conceive. But there is at least one state in which feeble attempts to achieve a better arrangement um, are apparent, the United States of America, 
where they refuse to allow immigration of elements which are bad from the health point of view and absolutely forbid naturalization of certain defined races and thus are making a modest start in the direction of something not unlike a national state. Mm. That's, he's describing the United States in the 1924 Immigration Act. So think of that quote, and when you think of President Trump's comment deriding immigrants from shithole countries and pleading more for more immigrants from Norway, that just is straight out of Mein Kampf. And when Hitler talks about our lax, when Hitler, sorry, when Trump talks about our lax immigration laws that are the mockery of the world, that is a constant refrain. That's that's the, the sort of so um, so we're used to that rhetoric. But what about ICE? Um, ICE predates this administration, um, and ICE is a, but ICE is nevertheless a novel American institution. It was founded in, 20, in 2003 by the Homeland Security Act in the, in the wake of 9-11. And, and that was a time when, to be frank, um, concern, that was not a very democratic time, as, as you recall. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, it's an organization that's like the police, but it's not the police. Uh, my, uh, what are we out of time? Oh, you got plenty of okay. time. You got like 10 minutes. Okay, so 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 uh, my grandmother wrote a memoir. My 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 grandmother wrote a memoir of the Holocaust of the 1930s in, in Berlin that I find extremely useful, um, and uh, and she talks in it. She has this vignette about Kristallnacht, where she runs over to the synagogue she attended to try uh, when they're burning it down, trying to burn it down, and they're making the the temple employee run over broken glass, the SA. And she gets a police officer to arrest the temple employee and bring him over to our uh, to her apartment to save. So the police are not completely interacting with the SA. Mm -hmm. uh, the police, because the S, the police, the police in a democratic society don't want, however faults, whatever faults they have, therefore generally not things burning down. And people <laughs> uh, so so so, and right now, um, so ICE. I, uh, and then what happened, Gleichschaltung, what happened was you had these institutions like the police corrupted by the SS and the SA and the Gestapo. They were no longer, uh, and what, what's happening now is you're getting progressive police chiefs standing up against us who are saying, you know, we're not going to let, uh, because crime rises when you send immigrants into hiding. So, so you see this structure, you see ICE functioning uh, they're focusing, it's an organization dedicated to hunt down, hunting down political outsiders attacked by the regime's propaganda. It's bumping up against the institutions and in society that are, uh, it, it doesn't fit into the into other institutions in society. Of course, obviously, the police uh, have problems in the United States that have not lived up to the role they're supposed to live up. And But nevertheless, I, ISIS is an institution that fundamentally does not fit into a democratic society. <coughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the Trump administration, the Trump administration has justified uh, shifting, targeting serious criminal offenders. Uh, to, uh, uh, so, so in the tw in 2014 memo, uh, 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 Jay Johnson, the uh, the then Homeland. Um, uh, 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 Secretary of Homeland Security, I think, uh, said ICE is only going to focus on, is going to prioritize serious terrorists and serious criminal offenders uh, mm -hmm. for deportation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so uh, in what the Trump administration has done is get, get rid of that letter and instead urge ICE to represent all criminal, all immigrants as serious criminal offenders. So uh, in a 2017 letter, then Home Secretary of Homeland Security John Kelly ordered ICE to portray immigrants in general as criminals. Um, so this tactic of identifying whole groups as criminal is a shameful history. Uh, I have a New York Times piece on it called Who is a Criminal? My grandmother went into Sachsenhausen many times to, uh, as a disguise as a Nazi social worker to smuggle people out. Um, with forged free passes. And she talked about how no one knew what was happening in the concentration camps. Um, and she talked about how German Jews in 1937 weren't that worried, because they said they're only arresting criminals. But she knew they were arresting people even with traffic tickets. 
says a piece I have in the New York Times called Who is a Criminal? So that tactic of painting everyone in the group as a criminal. I mean, I don't want to, it's tricky because I don't want to double down on carceral logic because criminals aren't criminal, as it were. I mean, just because someone did a crime doesn't mean, but, uh, but that tactic of, of painting people as everyone is a serious criminal is familiar. Um, now, to be sure, there's no organization exactly like the SS or the SA right now. There's no organization in power to make arrests that originated as a parliamentary force or that has an official racist ideology or that is used to target explicit political opponents. Um, but there are concerning similarities between ICE and the Gestapo and the SS. Um, and what we've been discussing recently are the detention camps. Uh, so what about the detention camps? How much do they resemble concentration camps in the 1930s? Uh, so, uh, so there, there were no death camps in the 1930s. In fact, um, in Dachau, uh, there were like two deaths in August 1933. There weren't even a lot of deaths, uh, depending on the month, the year, the year, and which concentration camp you're talking about. There were no death camps. So that's in, less. What? That's less than we've seen. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you have to look. I, I just quoted August 1933, and there were other, but Sachsenhausen had a number of deaths. But yeah. You know, there weren't mass killings in concentration camps. They were torture centers. Uh, so, uh, so in early June, ju journalists are barred from, from visiting con uh, detention centers in the United States. In early June, the Trump administration canceled educational, recreational, and legal aid for unaccompanied migrant children in detention centers, sealing them off from, from public view. The Vera Institute is tasked with defending undocumented immigrants, uh, providing legal aid to <coughs> two minutes. Uh, the, uh, they've been told there's no more funds for that, uh, and that, the, that in the new detention centers for children, the children will be provided with instructional videos, the zero to five year old children. Uh, so uh, so, so the, the legal representatives, members of parliament with two week notice, members of Congress with two week notice can visit these detention centers, but legal representatives now are going to be barred because there's no more funds for legal services. But even if we are shut up, even as we are shut off from the facts, immigrants will hear what's happening in these detention centers from each other. Now, what is the purpose of the uh, detention centers? Well, let's start with the purpose of the uh, concentration camps in Germany post I mean, in the, in the no, take the November pogrom of 1938, um, where 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to concentration camps. The goal was to get them to self-deport. Um, in Nicholas Voxman's uh, book, Kahal, A History of Nazi Concentration Camps, he said uh, he, they mass released these 30,000 Jews from concentration camps. He said, from the regime's perspective, the camps had served their function, forcing many Jews out of Germany. The goal of the concentration camps was to provide brutal, torturous conditions to get German Jews to self deport. Well, that is the goal of these detention centers, mm -hmm. that's their explicit goal. And, you know, uh, so, so we're getting fascist, clear fascist tactics. Finally, let's look at how these institutions are transforming society. Well, one thing that I look for when I'm thinking of 1930s Germany is I'm looking for the way the economy gets intermingled with these institutions. So, um, so Wall Street gives billions in loans to function the profits of companies who run detention centers, large company, co of companies, as we know from Wayfair, law, make profits by selling their wares to them, and former high-ranking administration officials like John Kelly serve on their boards. Time, uh, time's up. Okay, uh, and with that, so, <laughs> the, uh, with that, I shall conclude. Yeah. Uh, I, I hate cutting people off, but that's the limited time we have. Uh, that was uh, Jason Stanley. Uh, the final speaker is myself. Brendan, can you give me a time cue after 10 and after 13? Yeah. We've only got two minutes left. Uh, but, but I first am going to introduce myself, which doesn't count against my time. Uh, my name is Andrew Klein. I'm a professor emeritus of economics at Pace University. Uh, I'm the author of Combating White Nationalism, Lessons from Marx, which is part of Marx's two missed initiatives, uh, Resisting Trumpist Reaction and Left Accommodation pamphlet, and I'll be speaking about this in the next session. Uh, my writings include two books, the red and black one, 
reclaiming Marx's capital, or refutation of the myth of inconsistency, and the white one next to it, the failure of capitalist production, underlying causes of the Great Recession. Uh, I work with Marx's Two Minutes Initiative, and I write for uh, with sober senses. So I'm going to be doing a uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I might need to move to where Bill is at points. Okay, so I'm going to begin right now. What the hell is this? <laughs> Why am I not seeing the whole screen? It's true. Oh, yeah. We can see. Oh, you can see the whole screen. Okay. 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 Good. okay. okay. So. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is talking about Obama Trump voters. People who voted for Obama in 2012 flipped, voted for the Republican Trump in 2016. Uh, there's a story among the anti neoliberal left that these people were rebelling against neoliberalism. Alternatively, the hypothesis is that they were actually embracing authoritarianism, racism, and misogyny. Um, <clears throat> Okay, here's how I'm going to do this. How do I move this? Okay, okay. So, as imagined by the anti neoliberal left, these people who flipped from Obama to Trump, um, well, you know, rebellion against neoliberalism. In, in writing in dissent, Sarah Jaffe wrote, ignoring the economic needs of working people, Thomas Frank has written time and again, that would lead to disaster, and in 2016, disaster arrived. Parts of the working class bit back, repaying decades of neglect with a vote for Trump. Uh, writing in The Guardian, Naomi Klein wrote, a good chunk of Trump's support could be peeled away if there were a genuine redistributive agenda on the table. Uh, and even more emphatically, writing in the so Social Democratic Jacobin publication, uh, Josh Mountain said that if the Democrats were to make a real commitment to confronting income stagnation, rising inequality, and the increasing power of the rich uh, in American politics, they, the Democrats, would win back many of the working class whites who flipped from Obama to Trump. Uh, you might be wondering how these people know these things. Uh, the answer is they don't. <laughs> They're just making this up. And if you want to understand how the left has paved the way for Trumpism, okay, with its post-truth politics, it's the left's allowing this kind of stuff to go on again and again and again unchecked, where people just get to say whatever they want, and there are no checks as to accuracy. There's no possibility of debate. The left bears responsibility here for letting that kind of thing go. These people, as we're going to see, are, are absolutely wrong. Um, OK, so there are two views. There's the Michael Gore view, which is the same thing we've just been hearing. What do, you, what do you do about the fact that these voters are, are, are racist? Michael Moore said, well, they're not racist. They voted twice for a, middle man, for a man whose middle name is Hussein, in other words, Barack Obama. That seems to many people to be knocked down evidence that these folks who were Obama voters and flipped to Trump were not racists. Well, the answer to that was given in a humorous way by the humorist David Sedaris a few years before that in an essay on Obama. He says, my first boyfriend was black as well. But that doesn't prove I'm colorblind, just that I like big butts. <laughs> okay, so that goes part of the way to answering this, but, you know, did people vote for Obama because they like big butts or big ears or vote for Trump because they like tiny hands? No. What, what is the real thing going on? Okay, a couple things we got to keep in mind. In marked contrast to McCain and Romney, the Republican candidates in 2008 and 2012, Trump made racial animus and white supremacy central to his campaign. And so it's quite possible that a large share of Obama-Trump voters were willing to vote for Obama when race was not a salient election issue. But they lined up behind white supremacy when the prospect of its triumphant restoration became a serious possibility. Okay, we gotta take that seriously. Also, it was only after Obama was elected that many racist whites without college education came to recognize that the Republicans are the white people's party. Okay, these are numbers from Pew. Yeah. Whites without a college education, non-Hispanic. Okay, only after Obama is elected. They go for the Republicans, less support for the Democrats. Big, big gap. Uh, Second election of Obama. 
Yeah, each time there was a, a, a bump. Uh, Sides, Tesla, and Gavrik in their book Identity Crisis explained it as follows. Before the election of Obama, because these people tended to follow politics less closely, they had not fully learned or internalized the long-standing divisions between the parties on civil rights and other issues related to race. So the fact that they voted for Obama is not dispositive in terms of racism. Okay, what I want to focus on is what I have come to call the basket of deplorability. Attitudes that are anti-black, anti-woman, anti-immigrant, anti-ACA, Obamacare, anti-Obamacare, and the desire for authoritarian leadership. I wanted to investigate this issue myself. Why did these people flip to Trump? So I went to the ANES, the American National Election Study uh, for 2016. A lot of people have looked at that, but surprisingly, very, very few studies have honed in just on Obama-Trump voters and looked at this specific population and why they flipped. Uh, mine is only the third study that I know of to focus on these people. Uh, so for each of these different uh, dimensions, there are attitudes, uh, scales of multiple questions, three questions uh, to 13 questions. Okay. Um, and here you can see some differences between the Obama voters who voted for Clinton and those who voted for Trump. Um, in every case, those who continue to vote Democratic, the, the numbers are in the low to mid 30s. With the Obama Trump voters, it's from the high 40s to the low 70s. And it's close to uh, the Obama Trump voters' average score is almost double that of the uh, Obama Clinton voters. And I'm going to be focusing, because this is a panel on authoritarianism, uh, about the desire for authoritarian leadership. And that's like right in the middle of, of this. Um, the, the basket of deplorability average is the same as the uh, average number for uh, the authoritarian leadership variable. Okay, now, why do I call this a basket of deplorability? Well, it's very original, right? I, I, <laughs> okay, but it's a basket because what I began to see when I was looking at these uh, variables in, in, the, in the study numbers is that these are not neatly separable, distinct right. variables. There are a complex of factors that are closely interrelated or a basket of deplorability. One way to uh, see how closely related are is to look at the correlation coefficient, which would go to, from zero, if these things were absolutely independent of one another, to 100% if two variables moved in lockstep. Like if you know anti-women attitudes moved in absolute lockstep with anti-black uh, attitudes, that would be 100%. Okay, many of these numbers are in you know the high 40s, the 50s, and even the 60s. When you begin to get numbers like that, that's unusual, okay? Um, and we see that with the authoritarianism uh, leadership variable. Correlation between that and anti-black attitudes, 54%. Between that and anti-women attitudes, 57%. Between that and anti-immigrant and immigration attitudes, 65%. That's really unusual. Uh, and 42% hostility to the ACA. What does hostility to the ACA have to do with authoritarian leadership? I don't completely know the answer. This is something to, to work out. But these things are closely related. Fox News. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is to show you what I mean. What, what are the actual uh, questions that I'm asking, um, or that ANES asked uh, when we got this authoritarian leadership? Question The country needs a strong, determined leader who will crush evil and take us back to our true path. The country would be great if we honor ways of our forefathers, do what the authorities tell us, and get rid of the rotten apples ruining everything. These two first questions are from Bob Altemeyer's. Uh, right-wing authoritarianism scale, for people who know that. Uh, I saw a few other variables that I thought were of interest here. Good for the U.S. to have strong leader, even if the leader bends the rules to get things done. And the, some people favor the government torturing of suspected terrorists and protesters being roughed up for uh, disrupting political events on the grounds that they deserve it. What you see is that the Obama-Trump voters' attitudes were much more authoritarian here 
than the non-Trump voters, and they rivaled and at times even surpassed in terms of desire for authoritarian leadership uh, the attitudes of other Trump voters. Uh, and I also looked at, which a lot of people never do, answers that these people volunteered, not just their answers to multiple choice questions, but information they, they volunteered. They were asked, is there anything in particular about Donald Trump that might make you want to vote for him? This is before the election. And people eventually did vote for Trump. Um, in, in this survey, there were strong indications of authoritarian attitudes in some of the uh, Obama Trump voters volunteered responses. Action oriented, for Mesa, he's straightforward, strong will to change America, no nonsense approach, strong person, businessman, no nonsense man, business mindedness, pretty aggressive, straightforward, straightforward and blunt, tough. Chance he may run the country like a successful business. Authoritarianism, because next to the police and the military, the most authoritarian institutions in this country are businesses. A businessman knows how to run a business, build a wall, round up all them people, securing the borders, strong immigrant control, tough on immigration. A lot of tough on immigration answers there. So even in the way they wanted to characterize themselves, clear evidence uh, in a number of responses of authoritarian attitudes. So what I did was to take this basket of deplorability, you know, the, the, the five different dimensions, and create one single variable the basket of deplorability, and rank the uh, answers from the most deplorable to the least deplorable, and then divide it up in groups of 5% each. So 20 groups of 5%, that's known as ventiles. Okay? So among the low ventiles, there was very little support for Trump and a lot of support for Clinton. So zero would be love Clinton, absolutely loathe Trump, get to one, you know, one is lock her up, make America great again. Okay, so most of these people, these were Obama voters after all, dislike Trump, even when you get to fairly modestly high levels of deplorability. Okay, but when you get to the three highest 5% groups, support for Trump goes up. Finally, you get people liking Trump more than Clinton, and then, you know, 75%. So among extremely deplorable voters uh, who voted for Obama, uh, there was a lot of pro-Trump feeling. Okay, a couple ways of looking at this uh, in addition. In this highest 5% group, most deplorable 5%, more than four-fifths of them preferred Trump. Next most deplorable group, more than three-fifths of them Okay. Next most deplorable group, almost two-fifths um, supported uh, Trump. Okay. Within the rest of the Obama voters, almost no support for Trump. Average, about 12.5% in the sample. Okay. But 80% of the top one, 60% of the second one. Okay. It's very clear that, that the Obama Trump voters are just not like, in terms of deplorability, racism, authoritarianism, the rest of the uh, Obama voter population. And here's one final way of looking at it. Fully 30% of the people who preferred Trump, uh, Trump, fully 30% of them were in the most deplorable 5%. Okay? Another 20-something percent in the next most highest, and another 15% in the next most highest. So two-thirds of the most deplorable voters, excuse me, two-thirds of the Trump supporters were in the most deplorable three groups. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, gonna have to rush through the regression results, but basically this is a way of saying what the uh, size of the effects are. Why did these people flip to Trump? Okay, stars mean that there's an effect that's not noise. Income, unemployed, job loss, all those economic factors, just noise. Authoritarian child trade preferences, wow. social spending, attitudes, none of that had anything to do with why these people voted for Trump. Uh, we get some slight effects that, you know, whites and males, once you've controlled for other factors, a slight uh, bit of uh, indication that isolation doesn't play a role, but these really big numbers all have to do with the basket of deplorability. And you can add up these numbers, like that 0.23 means that 
that scale going from zero to one, whether you like Clinton or whether you like Trump, okay? The most anti-black person is what this is saying, just because of that, the number goes up by 0.23, from like zero to 0.23, to 0.2 to 0.43. Could you stand for the left? Yeah, sure I can. And this will be on our, our website. Okay, so these five variables together, if you compare the least deplorable to the most deplorable voter, that would bump up the numbers by 0.9. So it would be going from zero to 0.9 in terms of how much you like Trump, on the maximum one. Okay, so in conclusion, who are the Obama Trump voters? They were not more likely to be experiencing economic hardship. Their reasons for voting for Trump bear little resemblance to the anti neoliberal left narrative. Their support for Trump has nothing to do with the experience of economic hardship or lack of education. Their attitudes about race, gender, immigration, and authoritarianism were far closer to other Trump voters than to non-Trump voters, and sometimes they were even more extreme than other Trump voters, as, as we saw. And the flip to Trump was driven by their Trumpian, in other words, deplorable attitudes as the regression results, which I can talk about more but on time, show. So in conclusion, the anti-neoliberal left has been barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> Few Obama-Trump voters want to take their country back to the pre-neoliberal era. What they want is to take their country back. Okay, we need to appreciate the broad support in the U.S. for Trump's reaction to be better equipped to fight it. And now is not the time for self-serving wishful thinking that the Trumpite base is a constituency ready-made for one's version of left politics and leadership. Uh-uh. They're Trumpites. Okay. And there is a real danger that the opposite is going to happen, that the anti-neoliberal left will be pulled further and further toward the camp of reaction as it seeks to accommodate the Trump white base in order to win it over. Thank you. based on two articles that are on uh, the Park Students Initiative website. So uh, this, this, the video we're, we're, we're digging, we hope to have it as well. Okay, so what we're going to do now is open up the floor for questions and for comments. And what I want to do is to take three at a time, and then uh, I'd like the panelists to come up and then uh, panelists can give brief responses, and then we'll take another story. I, I see you first. Go ahead. Um, oh, my question. Thank you very much, first, uh, for the. It's like anti war is killing me now. Um, you talked about Syria and you talked about all things, but I know Islamic Republic is not based on uh, socialism or whatever, but it's, I mean, to me, it's a, they are pro. Assad and by itself there are anti left and these days whoever talks about Iran and this anti war is labeled with oh you are pro Trump or you are pro Shah or you are pro this you are pro that. So I want a way to say that not anti not whoever says down with US imperialism is in a progressive side. So I want to find a way and what's your suggestion to make it uh, independent from to be against war, at the same time against fundamentalism and those mm -hmm. kind of a little bit the imperialist. Like Syria, one of the factor of Syria is Iran. It's not like you know, it's like Iran, Russia, and then in this side we have like uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and United States. So how to find a way that all my U.S. leftist comrades. Please, whoever says, I mean, Iran is bad, it's not pro-bombing Iran. And whoever says, darn it, in US, it's good. So I want you to kind of tell me or, you know, let me know how do you approach, because I have a message on my phone that come and see, we okay. let me talk, Ma talk about sure. that. Okay, so, so again, if, if you want not to be recorded, say that at first, uh, I see the gentleman in the back. Could you explain your last bullet on your slide, but moving over to reaction, I didn't quite follow that, it was too quick. I read Thomas Frank, that he 
convinced me. Can you also talk about calling people deplorable? I thought Hillary should have doubled down on that and not apologize. There's a whole view. You can't call people deplorable for whatever reason. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and then I saw Charlie. Yeah. So, well, a couple of thoughts. One is I just want to know, is your paper, are your papers going to be published? Because I absolutely hope they are. It seems so important. Um, it, it depends on the okay. individual. Oh. Uh, we're going to try to have a video and... No, no, are your articles... My, my articles are in With Sober Senses, okay, uh, on our website, and it's part of a book on Trumpism and the anti okay, okay, okay. okay. And I just want to say how enlightening, and I learned so much from all the presentations. I wasn't as much as I was through her. Um, I want to harken back to what Anne said at the beginning about sort of a tragedy. And I, um, well, two things. In Anne's presentation on Stalinist, I just couldn't help, I'm a psychologist, it did not seem to me, oh, there's a difference in terms of attitudes toward immigration, that psychologically the new Stalinists are not that different from white supremacists in their attitude of supremacy. And, oh, that's what we're talking about here. Like it's an underlying authoritarianism that's a key dimension to how we're looking at all of these political phenomena. The thing that uh, I take encouragement from is that the, the embers of uh, Marxist humanism and the struggle for freedom and the, is, is not out, obviously, because it's here. And as long as it's not out, there's a chance that it can rekindle. And uh, that's what gives me Okay, so we've got uh, three comments and questions. Uh, let's not forget Eric Andre, who's still there hanging on in London. Uh, you know, things can be directed to him. Uh, so I'll just let the panelists, starting with Jason, comment on whatever they would like to comment on. He passes, Bill. Uh, well, again, this is precisely the big challenge that we're facing, is to how to articulate an anti-imperialism, which is not cutting slack for authoritarian regimes like that of Iran. Uh, you know, I should make clear, you know, just taking, I don't, I don't think that quote unquote Iran is bad. I think that Iran's government is bad. And I think that if we're going to be in solidarity with the people of Iran against um, you know, US prevention and bombardment, uh, we should also be in solidarity with the people of Iran in their pro-democracy struggle against their own dictatorship. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think that we have to, uh, rather than you know, looking to uh, you know, Noam Chomsky and Chris Hedges and all these leftist talking heads, and I say this you know, as a, certainly on a much lower echelon, leftist talking head, you know, we should actually be listening to people from the region, actually listening, we're interested in getting a progressive perspective on Iran, we might actually want to listen to a progressive Iranians like Rita Alfari and uh, the uh, Alliance of Middle Eastern Socialists. So um, this, this is where it begins. Okay. Uh, and you, you missed a lot, but Charlie said something that was specifically about your presentation. Could you say yeah, that very briefly? Two things. One is that I was listening to your uh, description of the Stalinists, and it just struck me that I didn't psychologically, except for maybe attitudes for immigration, see virtually any difference with those white supremacists in their psychological authoritarianism, which is, I guess, what we pointed out. That there's, a, there's an underlying dimension that is common to these. The other thing is that I just said that, uh, in terms of your referring to tragedy, that uh, I do see some hope in the fact that we're here, and that there's that you and other people, not, that the embers have not gone out entirely, and that we can uh, get the flame going again. That's all. Do, do you wish to comment? You know, I'm yeah. uh, you, can, you can pass, or you can come. Well, I don't know how, how, I don't know their attitudes about everything. I haven't made any kind of a thorough study of them. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can ask this Larry who's, who's writing on the role. I certainly don't want to research them on the internet. The, the, feel, so of, the can, feel of them. The feel, the of, feel them. of them is so uh, retrogressive. For instance, they didn't have one woman on this panel. Now, I understand they were looking for for some, That's you know, acceptable. serious yeah. Marxist economists. So they got Andrew and and Rick Wolf, and but Good still, uh, yeah, <laughs> they didn't have one one woman. And um, 
it's rather unusual in this day and age to be totally insensitive to that question. And, that even, and even worse than that, uh, when they called for the people in the audience to line up at microphones to ask questions, they were all men. Every, well, you know, ten people at each mic were all men, and, and I objected. I made a fuss. I said, well, you've got to have some women, you know, come to the front of the line. And like the organizers who were young women, I should mention, the ones who organized it, they were like surprised. Um, so I just think that a lot of this stuff is coming back. What's the deplorables on the, on the, on the other end? <coughs> oh, okay. I've hardly sorry. ever seen excuse, excuse me, Eric. Okay, sorry. Excuse sorry. me, Eric, would you like to comment on this? Any of the questions that we've heard in the comments? Can you bring them back to the board as well? I'm going to try, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was on the board and he disappeared. I'm sorry, shh. So yes? Just like not at the moment. Not at the moment, okay. Um, now, when you wanted me to bring back a certain slide? The last bullet on the last slide where you said Naomi Klein. Okay, okay that, that was the last slide. The very bottom. The real okay. danger, that, yeah. okay. So I'm saying that basically the, the impulse among the anti-neoliberal left is to look for a ready-made constituency of people who are you know, disaffected with the whole system, and they're, they're not being, you know, <coughs> they're not in the neoliberal camp. And here we got them among these Obama-Trump voters. Okay, I'm saying that that is proven to be self-serving, wishful thinking. Okay, and the, the real danger is that the influence is going to go in the opposite way. That these people are trying to accommodate, you know, and make common cause with you know, these supposedly non-racist and, and, and so forth, Obama-Trump voters, and there's a, I, I've seen evidence of it, they're going to be pulled further and further into the camp of reaction as, as they, they do that. What but is that camp of reaction? The camp of reaction means the camp of, of, of Trump and Bannon and, 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 and people like that. So you well, what's your Thomas Frank and Naomi Klein are the one of the Bannon? I'm sorry? You're saying Naomi Klein and Thomas Frank are the one of the Bannon? I mean, no. There, I don't know whether they will wind up there, but, but, the, but, but that is the direction in which the things why, are moving. What is your evidence for that? Other than that, okay, they've got an illusion that the problem, okay, so you've just, okay. never mind their illusion. Okay, here, here. You take somebody like the head of Platypus, Chris Catron, <laughs> okay? This is supposedly a Marxist organization, but what, you've, what we've seen from Chris Catron on the grounds of you know not liking neoliberalism and stuff for, for many years now, even before the 2016 election, is he was making excuses for Trump. Okay? And basically you see this among a lot of people. They will come out and say that Trump is the lesser evil or not as bad or equally bad, uh, Joe Stein, oh yeah, well, I would wake up late, late at night in a sweat because of uh, Trump being elected, but also Clinton being elected. In many ways, she's worse, okay? Susan Sarandon said that. Anything that normalizes Trumpism, okay? Anything that normalizes Trumpism is an abomination. This is not politics as usual. This is proto-fascism, okay? And so, any time anybody makes it that the neoliberals are the lesser evil, excuse me, that the neo, any time anybody makes it that the neoliberals are the greater evil and Trumpism is a lesser evil, okay, that is accommodation. And if the, if the idea is to get the ear of the Trumpite base, that is a real move toward reaction as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So is another way of putting that in another language? And they're not intersectional? They're not no, it has nothing to do with that, although that's important as well. Okay, because you're focusing on. I, I, look, it's very simple. You don't normalize reaction. You don't normalize uh, proto-fascism. Right you, rec you recognize. Right that you recognize. Excuse, 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 excuse me. You, you, excuse me. Excuse me. You recognize that people who stand in favor so, of liberal so democracy, people who stand in favor of liberal democracy, no matter how flawed they are, are superior to those who are taking us down the road to fascism. Okay, I just wanted to, to, to finish, we can have more discussion. I'm done. Uh, does anyone else want to, want to speak? Just a quick, quick note about the expression of white working class. That's an expression 
I mean, Du Bois' 1935 Black Reconstructions, chapter one or chapter two, called it, uh, uh, The White Worker, uh, where he's talking about, that's where he introduced the concept of the psychological wages of whiteness. Yes. So the white working class has always been this expression in American history yeah. that is about a group of people who have racial, who have, you know, who feel their one form of payment is in their whiteness. And so, yeah, so I think it's tricky. You do have to confront that fact that the white working class is specifically a very, very problematic when we go to a new round of questions, <laughs> and you want to briefly get in on this? Yes, very briefly. I, I think uh, you have to make a distinction. Of course, there's a, a white worker, but the people who started saying Trump represents the white working class were in, uh, uh, acting as if there is a separate class of workers right. that's white. That's the problem. That's the problem. Further the dividing the country, exactly. right? Because the working class is full of black people and immigrants right. and Latinos. Right. So they, it's the no such thing no as a white working class or exactly. a black working class. And it's important that we say that. OK, exactly. we, it looks like we got room for two more questions yeah. and then yeah. responses. Yeah. Also, oh, excuse me, also, also comments. I can't, I, I can't get into the deplorability. I was interrupted several times in an attempt to okay. explain myself. Okay. So you go ahead, uh, and then we'll have one more. OK, if you, like my wife and I, spent 10 years in a white working class neighborhood that is keeping blacks out, it took us 10 years to get the white working class people in that neighborhood to throw out the racists. There is a group of white working class people that historically <coughs> have been organized by radical leftists who decide to move into the neighborhood and target them as people who can be shifted. And Thomas Frank, who came to our think tank to do research, points out the phrase parasites and producers is how Republicans give code to white working people who identify as the producers against the black, queer, immigrant parasites. So factually, there's a whole section of this discussion that has been written off. OK. Uh, one more comment, question. Um, I, I wanted to, to recap what you were, just, uh, what you were explaining about the, uh, the, the pinkies. Uh, well, it, it, it turns out that somehow the, the organizations such as uh, the, uh, the, the PLP, uh, organizations like that, yeah. tend to have more of a more of a uh, way to attract uh, people that are coming from straight from high school and so forth, uh, especially you know among people, the kids of color. You know, so I, I have to say that I think for the for the future. Somehow you could re-examine and really go, you know, get deep into into the situation of of, of, of the youth because somehow you know we got to understand that high, you know, school the school system do their best to really oppress um, young you know young kids' ability to think critically, you know, and you know have you know. Ha able to recognize that there are ways to, to join a group to, to express, um, not only to express the, the troubles that they're surrounded by, but also, you know, be able to be also to fall uh, victim of, 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 a, of a cult of personality figure that, that's going to, um, well, you know, um, I wish I could explain clearly, but uh, a figure that really in, it up, up great their not only their interest but their identity. You know. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I, mean, I didn't want to take over, but I was want to, I encourage you to, to do more. You know, to write more. I, I encourage you okay. to help yeah, us write about okay. this. Well, I, 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 my mind's on the people who want to you know not get up and, and be rude, but want to leave on time. We have four minutes left. I'm going to ask panelists to, to make brief. Uh, responses to directly to this point these points if they wish to I'm going to begin with Eric do you want to say anything about what we just heard 
not, uh, not briefly, uh, if, if we've only got four minutes, uh, basically some of the issues that people have been talking about about white working class uh, have applied uh, to Britain and um, there's been situations where sections have identified themselves as such. Um, even in the heyday of the strong, at uh, least the Communist Party uh, movement in Britain, uh, which do which dominated the trade unions for a long time, um, the, you know the, there was outbreaks of you know very anti-foreigner resentment amongst working class people. Um, sorry, amongst working class people. Uh, the famous case being the Dockers in 1969, which supported something called Enoch Powell. Um, when, the, uh, when there was a lot of talk, he was famous with, with, with a speech where he uh, called the rivers of blood speech. Um, and basically he got support, uh, he got support of a lot of uh, dock workers and they went on a march, um, you know, uh, a very anti-immigrant march. But, you know, uh, you know the, the different situation, I'm not going to take up all the time, but there's different situations where that what, that whiteness amongst the population that becomes important, and then it doesn't. It, then other times it's not as important. Um, it, it, I don't know. Britain is a slightly different situation from uh, America, anyway. Uh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll just end there to give people more time to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other panelists wish to respond to anything? Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe take the opportunity here to uh, touch on some of what we've been talking about, some of the stuff that I had to excise in the second half of my presentation. Uh, speaking about Syria, you know, this um, embrace of fascism overseas has very disturbing implications for our ability to resist it here at home. So there's a link between the accommodation of fascism in Syria and what I see is something of a left accommodation of fascism here in the United States. Among those who have portrayed the fascistic Trump as the lesser evil to the neoliberal Hillary Clinton are Jill Stein, John Pilger, and Slavoj Zizek. Glenn Greenwald is leading the pack of so-called leftist voices that are seeking to exonerate Trump of collusion with Putin. And initially there was a uh, resistance mobilizing in response to Trumpism, but it has become pretty quiet now that there is an actual concentration camp system being consolidated in the United States. Contrary to the pervasive worse is better logic, it is Trump who is getting away with far more than Obama and Clinton did to virtually zero protest from the left. Civilian casualties of US airstrikes in Syria and Iraq have jumped exponentially since Trump took over. And all the people who relentlessly baited Hillary as a warmonger are utterly silent because Trump is openly on the same side as Putin and Assad, backing up the dictator instead of backing the revolutionaries as Obama did in Libya with far lesser civilian casualties. The conventional wisdom that lefties only protest Republican warmongers is now a perfect reversal of reality. So I submit that you know, there's a link here between um, accommodating fascist regimes in Syria and, uh, and the, uh, the notion that the left, in fact, could be co-opted by, uh, by fascism here at home as well. I'll, I'll just be very brief. I agree with what everything, with everything Bill just said. In addition, you know, this thing about the white working class support for Trump, it's largely a myth, okay, because what is meant in the, by these people talk about working class is people who don't have four-year college degrees, okay? There's a lot of issues there, you know, because they might be business owners, okay? But also, you know, sometimes things happen to just go along with other things, okay? But when you look at what is the cause of this and that, you know, income, low income, unemployment, unemployment among close friends and relatives had absolutely nothing to do with people flipping from Obama to Trump. And there's been a lot of studies on Trump voters, and they've invariably found that support for Trump in the 2016 election had nothing to do with personally experienced economic hardship. Right. Okay. I do one of the very few studies on Obama Trump voters, but there's a shitload, excuse me, of, of research, empirical research, and economic hardship, economic distress, personal experience does not explain any bit of Trump support. Okay, it's unambiguous at this point. Okay, thank you.
And I think that it's a wrap. Please do sign the mailing list. We have one more panel coming up in a half an hour. And I'll be talking about the white working class. Oh. Oh.